because the thing with expedition life is the freedom is just so ultimate especially solo and on your own two feet like without any vessel or anything it's just it's a it's a sense of freedom that i've never experienced anywhere else hi and welcome to passing the outdoors my name is davy wright today we're going to have a moment on the path where we talk to adventurer jenny tuff she is about to release a book called solo um, and I wanted to catch up with her so she can tell us about it. I'll let her introduce it, but welcome, Jenny Tuff. Hi, Jenny, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Yes, very well. It's good to have you on remotely. Um, yeah, but... Excited to be here. Sorry, I'm not, I haven't made it back home to Scotland. Well, we'll, um, we'll sort that out in the future, but we we've got some more exciting things to, to talk about that's coming up soon. So you have a book coming out called Solo on the 7th of July. Tell, give us a brief description about what it's about. So I had a project that took me five years to run solo and I supported across a mountain range on every continent. And so solo is, it was literally just the stories of these six um, mountain ranges that I ran across. And it's not about the running itself because that's quite boring. Um, but more about the lessons that were delivered to me and the communities that I ran through and the cultures that I was part of and um, and how it, it really evolved my life. And the point was that I did that all solo and unsupported. And I think there's a lot of messaging that's really important, not just for women, but um, certainly for me, it was like a lot of coming of age and growing up and being able to do things completely on my own and really big and really scary things completely on my own. And all just in a celebration of that kind of independence and freedom and doing things on your own that I really hope anyone would be able to take away that message. Well, I think if you, anybody who follows you on social media, which is a couple of people, um, they will have seen your your kind of little messages that you put out. And I think a lot of people, and I've and I've heard and talked to a lot of people that have uh, that that find that very inspiring. Um, and and I know you have a bit of. Well, let's call it imposter syndrome, possibly. I think one discussions we've had before a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But I, th I think um, I think a lot of people will relate to uh, to the book, and um, I look forward to seeing the feedback that you, you'll get. I'm sure through your stories. Um, so, as I said before, we start recorded recording. I always reach out to somebody that we mutually know, um, and we'll reached out to our good friend Alex Roddy who um, has given me some yes has given me some some fantastic questions um okay. so he puts it rather more eloquently than, than i did when i was writing my questions but how do you think the process of completing the journey prepared you for the task of writing the book Ooh, ooh. so it was a funny one because i had done four of the mountain ranges and i still had two to go when i got when i signed the book deal so I signed a book deal before I finished the project and knew what it was about. And then that did definitely get in my mind for the last year, especially the last one that I felt I had this pressure that as soon as it ended, I had to know what the point of all this was. And I really didn't know like, what was the, like the big takeaway? Like why on earth did you run across six mountain ranges and what did you learn? And I was just like, I don't know. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a funny one because it was a process of the adventures still happening while I had started the writing and then I had a really tight deadline after I, I did the last mountain range was in Transylvania um and I kind of had to get straight home to my laptop and get this thing done while I was still very much in the haze of having just completed an endurance challenge um but I do to answer Alex's question I do really love the process of writing up my adventures when I get home it's a really good way to just process everything that's happened to you especially with a lot of those being really big adventures where I was away for like a month um, and again, alone, um, which just has an intensity to it. So getting home and writing them, I mean, whether book deal or not, that's what I do. I'm a writer. Like I keep journals and stuff. So I, I did write them all just as my own way of processing them. Going back and rewriting them, knowing that the public were going to be able to read them. This is no longer a journal. This is now public facing. That was a bit more daunting because that I'm an introvert. I mean, that's probably why I get on with doing this kind of stuff. I'm a very introverted private person. So sharing my struggles, my doubts, the things that I went through, like my thought process, um, everything that happened in my personal life, sharing that on the page um, and knowing that other people might read that one day, that was, that was really intimidating. That changed, that changed 
the project for me for sure. Well, yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't imagine, I mean, from coming back from even smaller, much smaller adventures, if you like, than, than you have, I can tell uh, you get that blues kind of phase, but to, to, to then have to sit down with the intensity of putting the or words to, to screen, as it were, uh, yeah. it must be quite difficult. Or not difficult, challenging, let's say. Yeah, I think there was, I mean, one thing that a lot of people tell you about really big journeys is that the meaning and the outcome might change years on from it finishing. So sometimes it works to have a really tight deadline to finish an adventure and have to get a magazine article out within a week. You know, I've done that and I can do that. Um, but then two years later, if you get asked to write about that adventure, you might say a completely different thing because you've had two years to process that. You've had two years to grow as a person. Um, so I think that was something that I mean, because the book covers five years of my life. So the first couple of chapters were things that I was writing about with deep hindsight, with, you know, being able to say what how that really changed me, because I know now how much something I did five years ago has changed me and created the adult that I am. Whereas writing about the one that was only a couple of months fresh at the time, I was like, I don't know. I can tell you how I feel about this now, but ask me in five years and, and I might have a completely different perspective on this one. So that was. Do you, do you think yeah, though yeah. that, have, do you think though that having the, the reflection of the first one and then the, and, and the, the learning from that, from that reflection, did that affect your reflection of the last one? Like so immediate, do you think you, do you know what I mean? A little, I mean, there's just a, there's a lot to be said for experience and being able to anticipate what, the come down is like when you finish um because that was something I didn't know the first time around you know I'd heard about post-adventure blues I maybe had a taste of them because you know it wasn't my first rodeo like I'd been out before and done stuff um but I'd never done anything as intense so the first one was I ran across Kyrgyzstan I was the first person to do it it took me 25 days it was a thousand kilometers it was it was it was a very demanding expedition um and I didn't I didn't expect the post-adventure blues to be what they were you know, it was, it was a full on depression. It was, it was really, really difficult. And I didn't really have the language around that. Cause it's just not something I was expecting. I just thought I was in a really bad place. You know, I didn't, I didn't really understand what was going on. And so I didn't have a plan for it. Whereas, you know, now, you know, five years later and having done six of them, you know, by the time I got to the fifth and sixth ones, like I was a pro at it, you know, everything was had really fallen into place for me. I knew what I was doing. Um, it was almost difficult on that level just because I knew what to expect. So you don't have the same excitement as you do at the outset, but you just kind of like, you know, that in a few weeks time, you're going to have athlete's foot. And in a few weeks time, you're going to be depressed. Your ankles are going to be swollen. You're going to have to go home and it's going to be bo- like, there's just kind of that like, oh, do I really, am I really going to do another round of this? So that so that initial one after Kyrgyzstan, the initial blues, how did you have to, as an introvert, as you said there, were you able to reach out to anybody for help or how did you process that? You know what I heard? I was at a festival because once I, one thing I really underestimated about doing a world first expedition was that um, the adventure industry really opened up to me kind of immediately. So I was very quickly thrust into public speaking and, you know, being guests on things. And I was at a festival that I was speaking at and I heard another person who I really admired mentioned just really offhand post-adventure blues. And it was a phrase that I'd never heard or used before. And it just really clicked for me. And then I started just kind of looking into it and speaking to other people and hearing other people's approaches that, you know, some people just say that they immediately treat it like a depression and they'll go as far as going on the drugs as soon as they go home. Whereas other people will just say like, you know, it's, it's a phase and I put a time limit on it and when it's over, it's over and I move on. And, everyone had their own approach. And of course, you know, that's mental health. Everyone's going to have their own approach. Everyone's going to have unique needs. Um, But just having the language and knowing that it was a thing that I wasn't just in a funk, that I wasn't just a sad person, knowing that there was a real thing with a real reason behind it. And I think anyone with anything to do with their mental health or even physical health, as soon as you have something relating to a diagnosis or a word to put on it, you're just like, okay, if I know what it is, then I know that I can treat it. Can deal with it. I don't know yeah. that this isn't me. This is a thing. And yeah, so that was, I think after that, that was just really the unlocking moment. And then I just said, okay, well, it's post adventure blues, which means it's not lifetime. It's just for this little phase after Kyrgyzstan. And all I have to do is, you know, treat it like if you went on an expedition and you got injured, which is very likely, you would come home and you would treat that injury, which I normally do. I normally, like, yeah, my feet do get really messed up. My knees get sore, whatever it is. And I get home 
I say, right, there's a physical plan of recovery. And now I just say, right, well, that's another injury that I picked up is my mind is now a little bit goosed. And so when I get home, it's got to be on a recovery plan as well. So what is, what is your remedy? Uh, I might get called out on this not being a cure, but um, it's just having something else to look forward to. So I, I like to have something else planned before I go out the door. Because I know if I come home and it's just like, you're back to four walls, you're back to routine, you're, you you can feel really trapped. Because the thing with expedition life is the freedom is just so ultimate, especially solo and on your own two feet, like without any vessel or anything. It's just it's a, it's a sense of freedom that I've never experienced anywhere else in the back country with a small backpack, you can do whatever you want. It's leaving that there's almost no type of life that has that kind of freedom. So that's, what's hard, I think. So for me, it's always been just planning something else to look forward to, to have a project to sink my teeth into on this last one. It, that project had to be writing the book, which was, was definitely difficult. Um, but yeah, generally it's, it's just been know that there's another trip on the horizon, know that, this isn't over. I'm still going to be that best version of myself that I think I am when I do big adventures. Um, yes, yeah, so I just I just keep going <laughs> rather than face it. Well, I just keep uh, on going uh, new adventures. That actually probably segues quite nicely into Alex's next question. Um, this is so. Do you think you've developed or strengthened transferable skills from one that helped you complete the other? For example, resilience or mental discipline. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, Alex. We knew you'd get this. Um, yeah, I mean, it was insane. I had a lot of moments on the sixth run, the one that happened in Transylvania, where I was looking back on the girl who did the very first one five years prior in Kyrgyzstan. And it was just like the things that scared me on that one, the things that I got wrong on that one, you know, the mistakes that I made. They're just so silly and trivial to me now that I almost like going through that chapter of the book, I was actually really embarrassed by a lot of it because I was just like, oh, I wouldn't make those mistakes now. And I wouldn't have that mindset. I wouldn't have that much fear. I mean, I still have fear and I still have anxieties and, and things that I find difficult, but I've mastered them to a whole new level by now. Um, so yeah, every, and that's something that I really love about adventure is, you know, something I always talk about is your comfort zone being a very fluid line, what you're capable of. It might be here right now, but it's fluid. If you push that and you edge it out a little bit further then you're capable of this much. And if you keep on going, and that's basically what I did over the last five years is I took myself from this comfort zone and I brought it up to here. And yeah, so I just, yeah. From your, from your learning and terms. from your experience, you've been able to push, push that. that yeah, level. yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then he kind of flips on his head and says, and looking at the, the other way around, how does creativity play any role or does creativity play any role in your long distance journeys? I think adventure is a creative pursuit, to be honest. Um, at least that's the way that I like it. I think the adventure world has a has a culture of being the first or the fastest and just kind of challenging, competing with each other and competing with known routes. And I actually think that culture is really toxic. I think that adventure should be creative. It should be exploration and that can be external and internal. Um, it doesn't matter. It can be places of the world. It can be things that you can do with yourself and your body. So for me, and something I always challenge with myself on the things that I pick to do is making sure that they are incredibly important to me, that they, you know, they do fire up my creative spirit, that they do feel like an exploration for me. Um, that's way more important to me than anything to compete in. You know, it's funny that three of those expeditions, I could have gone the whole Guinness World Record route and had my name like put up as the first person to do something. But I was like, I don't think that's what adventure is. I don't think that company Guinness World Records should actually be involved in outdoors pursuits like it just didn't it just didn't gel with me I thought the vibe would be really ruined if I did that and I'm glad that I, I did go down that route maybe I'd have a better career if I was the type of person that would pursue getting those titles but you know a thousand people could run across Morocco and they'll come back with a thousand amazing stories and they could take a thousand different little routes because there's just so many ways to do something like it just no yeah i suppose, I suppose it's what you what you as a person or what the, the individual who's going for it wants to take out of it as if it's a guinness world record then that's what they want to get if it's the experience and and the personal yeah growth, then, and to then me that's, that's just not really and this might be a controversial statement but to me that's not adventure to me that's you know you can be an athlete that was great love athletes admire them but um yeah to me the the first and fastest in the competition route that's 
not adventure. It's, it's adventure adjacent, but to me, it's, it's, that's an athletic challenge, which is a different thing. It's a different vibe. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not what I did. So coming away from the kind of running and going on to something like the South Road Race, which you've done, which is a competitive yeah. event. And, and I've heard you talk about that event before and you've, you put yourself under a bit of pressure because you had people behind you that may be catching you. How does that fit into your, to that? I think that's where I get to let my, that athlete ego in the back of my mind. I think that's when I get to let her loose. Um, and I've really found it a good balance for me to have this kind of like this adventure creative world where, you know, I am this little left wing hippie that just loves to run in the mountains and explore and meet new people. Um, but there will always be that side of me that wants to push really hard. That wants to see what I'm capable of. That really wants to like get into that cave. Um, so getting into the ultra racing world and kind of having the balance of the year of doing a couple of each, doing that athletic competition and then just doing the creative adventure. That's been a really good balance for me. So yeah, the Silk Road, I did it twice. I think I could have only been successful the way that I was because I'd already run across the Kyrgyzstan and had that time to really explore. So when I went back on my bike to compete in that race, I was able to put my head down and just see, okay, like I do know Kyrgyzstan now and I love Kyrgyzstan, but this time I want to see what I can put myself into. And then, you know, you end up riding through the night and you don't see anyone or speak to anyone because you've just been hammering your pedals all night and keeping your head, head in your handlebars. And, and I love that stuff, but it was really important to me to already have had that base of, of an expedition across Kyrgyzstan that I did in my own way. Yeah. Okay. Okay, right. Well, we'll keep this one short and sweet because we're going to keep the, the, the rest of the juicy details to, uh, for a sit down together. Um, but looking forward to uh, seeing how the, uh, the public react to your book. I've heard good things from our uh, previous oh, manager, so Brent Alex. He, uh, he has let some, uh, or he's told me that it's, uh, it's very good. Um, so I'm sure uh, everybody else will too. So good luck with the launch. Um, Thanks. This and... is kind of scary. You just really brought that home for me. This in a week. <laughs> oh my god! It's coming. I think gonna read it. So the book's out when? July seventh. July seventh. Available everywhere books are sold. <laughs> of course. Okay, Jenny. Thank you, and uh, I'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, I can't wait to see you. Cool. It was great to catch up with Jenny and uh, a real insight, a very short insight. Uh, as we said there, we're going to sit down in real life and um, and talk about her path in the outdoors at some point in the future. So, meanwhile, get her book. It's out on the 7th of July in all good bookshops online and hopefully in store. And um, let us know what you think about it. See you again soon.